I wrote the help that you see when you type get help um, in PowerShell 1 through PowerShell 3. Um, then I went to Azure AD and I wrote a bit of the Azure AD SDK. And then I saw Azure PowerShell help. Wow. <laughs> so um, I switched <laughs> over and I um, tried to bring some manage adult supervision to Azure PowerShell help. And um, we combined everything that had been done, good morning, we combined everything that had been done on one page. Um, if you guys want to try Help Writer, the keys are up here, the little USB keys are up here. Um, we combined everything on a page for Azure PowerShell help. I documented Azure Azure Resource Manager, the first 20 or so commandlets of Azure Resource Manager. And then I got ripped. So um, I went to Sapien Technologies. I worked for Sapien Technologies in Napa, California. Um, I've been there almost exactly a year. Um, and I'm now an MVP. How cool is that? I've been an MVP for about a month. Yes. Thanks. I think I have you guys to thank for that as well. Um, all of this stuff is up on GitHub, um, and I keep updating all of, in fact, all of my repositories are presentations. So if you ever see me at a user group or um, hear a presentation or watch one on YouTube, you can always find them on GitHub, and it's github.com slash Uh Here we go. So if you're using PowerShell Help Writer, um, and there are little keys up here for it. And if you take the key, you have to take my business card, too. That's how I distribute these guys. Um, so anyway, um, this is a key to the entire Sapien suite for 10 calendar days. And PowerShell Help Writer is the um, executable file with the PHW. When you open it, it will ask you for a key. Um, the key is in the PDF file. Okay. Never open PDF files unless you're sure you know what's in there, except for this one, where I told you the license key is in here. Okay. Um, PowerShell Studio is on there too. You'll see me using it. Again, this is not a product demo or anything of the type. So what we're gonna do today, um, and I've actually never done this in an hour, is that I'm gonna help, help walk you through writing help for your own commands. So if you, have, if you have some functions that you'd like to work with, grab your laptop, open it up and we're gonna work, okay? This isn't a lecture, okay? Um, after that key expires, you can go to our website and get 45 more days. The Help Writer product is 49 bucks, something like that, US. Um, it's hard to give a discount when something costs two pizzas or one woman's shoe, not the, other, <laughs> not the pair, but. Um, and they priced it that way because it's a 1.0, Right? And because they really want people using it. When you're out on GitHub and you have a repository and you're working with multiple people and you're using comment-based help, that means that your code files have your help in it. They're not separated out so that people can work in it independently. Um, and that's really a problem. So this generates XML help and it places it, it names it correctly, um, and it places it exactly where Get Help looks for it. Um, so this is my baby, this product. Um, it has everything in it that I always wanted in a tool at Microsoft and couldn't get, right? <laughs> so it doesn't use C sharp, it uses get command, right, to discover the commandlet. So anything that get command can get, this tool can get, right? So any command type in any module type, and it goes and gets everything that I use when I write help. So it gets the commandlet attributes, it gets the parameter attributes. It knows that for inputs, right, and outputs, so outputs, it, it grabs the output type. For inputs, it knows that these are parameters that pass value, that pass um, value through the pipeline, right? It knows help. So, and this is just a 1.0. It will get better and better and better and better, okay? When you save the XML file in PowerShell, three and later, it expects your XM, or even two, I think, it expects your help file to be in this location. So this is a, a language specific 
um, directory of your module directory. In PowerShell 4, this changed, but I think there are very few people even now who are writing modules intended only for PowerShell 4 or PowerShell 5 and later. Okay. If you have both comment-based help and XML-based help for the same module, comment-based help will take precedence. So if you create XML-based help, and you don't do something to your comment-based help, you will never see your XML help, okay? The, XM, the, the dot external help keyword takes precedence over everything else in comment-based help. It is required only for functions. If there is an error in your comment-based help, and I'll show you this in just a minute, it ignore, if there's one typo in any comment-based help keyword, it will ignore all of your comment-based help, and the default is auto-generated help, which is mostly blank. That's true in a script module, in a manifest module, right? If you have both, if you have XML help, it will um, fall back to XML help. But for the most part, if there's a typo in any of those comment keywords in any way, your fallback is auto-generated help. It looks just like get command. Okay? And this is how you add an external help keyword. Okay? It's dot external help and the file name of your help file on the same line. This is all documented. Nothing, nothing new here at all. Okay? So comment-based help is fragile. And this is just a slide to show you. So here I've left the S off of synopsis. I have a script module. You'll see that my root module or module to process key is populated. You guys know the difference between a script and a manifest module, right? So um, for a script module, the root module or module to process key is populated. Otherwise, if that key either doesn't exist or has a null value and your, your um, files are, are associated with a nested modules key, it becomes a, mo a manifest module. That's the only difference. But if I leave one character off of synopsis, I end up with auto-generated help. It ignores everything in my comment-based help. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip through this. This was part of my um, talk on writing help as a specification. And the idea there, I think it's kind of interesting, is that typically <laughs> when you do a code project, you write a code specification and you code based on the specification, right? And the deal is that this isn't PowerShell 1, this is PowerShell 5, okay? We're getting to be developers, we're writing code for an enterprise, you can write a spec. And writing a spec in help saves you a lot of time, okay? Your examples become pester tests, right? Your description becomes a guideline for the way people should code, okay? You, it gives you time to do things like design <coughs> your parameter names, not just throw them in or guess. Okay? And if you write your help before you write your code, then by the time you're finished with your code, your help is, is virtually done and all you need to do is revise. Okay? So it's an interesting concept. Um, I don't see a lot of people doing it, but that's the way I code. So when I have an idea for a module, for a function, Right? As soon as I have that sort of nugget idea, I start to write my help. And my examples are the way I want my inputs and outputs to work. Okay? And I write my output type first because I know it. I know what I want to produce. I know my goal. Right? And as I begin to write my help and as I begin to write those examples, I begin to define what I want. Now, I know this is a radical idea, because usually people are just in there coding first, right? But writing help as a specification is a very cool thing. I actually have a blog post about this for PS Blog Week, and it's called Advanced Help for Advanced Functions. And I'm using advanced um, in two ways there, meaning it's advanced in terms of PowerShell and it's advanced functions, but it's also writing it in advance. And writing your examples really are testing. 
because you test parameter combinations and input possibilities. You test piping and you get a sense of where you need to pipe, where it's convenient to do that by using it. And then you can use your example input and output as expected in PESTER. So we're pretty much ready to write help. Are there people who have brought their code along to be documented? Cool, so let's get started. Um, this is very participatory. I'm not a very formal person, so feel free to jump in and add your ideas. So one of the things that I like to do when I'm writing help content is to find a buddy, because it's sometimes very difficult to document your own help. One of the most important things to remember when writing help is that these aren't code comments, okay? You are not describing the implementation of your function, right? This is a black box, right? You discuss the implementation of your function in a blog post, right? Talking about the techniques that you use. You might share that with a friend. When it comes to help and the UI, no one cares how you implemented it, right? Unless it doesn't work, right? So what you're describing is not the implementation, and you need to step out of your code, right, and look at it from an entirely different perspective. That's a really hard thing to do, okay? So it's very smart to send your code to a friend, you've got it up on GitHub, you've put it in Pastebin, you send them a zip file, and, and trade. You know, he does you a favor or she does you a favor and documents your functions and then you switch and you do her a favor and document hers, okay? Forget the MVPs. You are not trying to impress anyone in this exercise other than your users, right? This isn't a chance to be clever about code. This is a chance to be crystal clear, okay? And you need a very beginner frame of mind. Forget everything that you know about the function that you just wrote and approach it as though you have never seen it before because that's the perspective of your user. Okay. So this is a little, um, these are, this is a little um, um, June's grammar seminar. Okay. Really quick. I don't know how well this translates. Um, I'm humiliated that I speak only English, um, but I think you'll get the idea. So you want to use very clear, simple language. You want to use the simplest <clears throat> verb that covers the case. So it's get and not retrieve. It's use and not utilize. Utilize is not a word in any language. It doesn't mean anything more than use, right? Use change, not modify or adjust. I don't want to hear if you desire to, you know, if you feel that you might wish to. No! Right? To do this, do this, right? Okay? Be careful with um, words that can be ambiguous, like remove. I want to know what this does, right? Okay? Do you Yes. Just a question there. I'm so frustrated with the Azure commands because they use subscription name yeah. instead of name and yeah. all that for parameters. Yeah. Do you have any recommendations on or is there someone working on sort of best practice for that? I got fired for working on that project. I'm not quite sure what no. to say. Um, <laughs> I mean, it really makes sense. <laughs> yeah. So, so you know, so at some point I'm going to do a talk about help in an open source world, yeah. right? Um, I think it's incumbent on all of us to go back, figure out what those things do, and write the help. Yeah. You know, um, one of the problems with the Azure PowerShell commandlets, and I don't know if this is still true, is that you couldn't pipe to them because they all pipe, uh, they use a value from pipeline by property name, and the yeah. property names don't match. No, that's, it. <laughs> that's terrible. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, you know, <laughs> and what they tell you, and they really mean it, is that if you don't like something, it's on GitHub, go fix it. You know, it's, That's crazy. yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I, I, I don't really want to go there. It's very no. frustrating for me um, because I use Azure mm -hmm. and I use Azure PowerShell. Yeah. So I actually have to use yeah. these things. Yeah. So um, get back to the school marm thing. Okay. <coughs> Passive voice does not name the actor. So it happens, mm -hmm. right? The objects can be exported. Your user doesn't know if they need to export them or if you're exporting it for them, 
okay? This happens, does not help anyone, right? You need to make it very clear. You can export the objects, right? You must export the objects, okay? Be very clear, and if you, if you end up with this passive voice format, you realize that you're missing some information, right? The passive voice is designed to obscure the actor, and you don't want to do that in help. <clears throat> yes. I think um, I'm not sure about that. I think it might. <coughs> yeah. But I think it may also be perhaps a little cultural thing. Mm -hmm. so I think uh, in the UK, it's a passive voice is almost preferred. Right. And, uh, right. I think the alternatives seem somewhat less less concise and less precise. Right. Somehow. Yeah. They 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 might seem less precise, and they might even in some cultures seem rude. Right. You do this. But I think when you're struggling to learn something, the last thing that you need is another level of abstraction, mm -hmm. okay? The person is already trying to figure out how to use your function, right? And being polite or even being concise <coughs> is not the goal, right? The goal is to enable the user to use the function. And at that point, I think it's whatever it takes. Now, in some cultures, it might seem so rude that you actually do want to adjust a little bit, um, but I don't think that's typical for this audience, right? I think that developers are used to figuring things out for themselves or hardly any help at all, and whatever help you give them I think is appreciated, but being clear doesn't waste their time. Nobody wants a story in their help, right? Okay, so a couple of other things. Give instructions in the order that the user needs them, okay? So this is my favorite one, okay? Click Run in the Things section of the Home tab. All right. Okay. You can almost feel your brain trying to rewire itself. Okay. So here's, here's the way to do this. Click the Home tab, and in the Things section, click Run. Okay. To find the parameter value, right, run this commandlet, pipe it to this, and use the result as input, okay? In the order that the user needs to do it, okay? Yeah, task first, then instructions. Instead of use the format parameter to format the date. What's happened here? The person has fallen in love with their parameter mm -hmm. and their implementation, and they've forgotten that the user is over here trying to format the date. When users who speak left to right languages, anybody here doing Arabic or Hebrew or Japanese? No, okay. Left to right languages, users skim down the left side of the page. So you want to put the goal of the activity in the first part of your sentence. To format the date, to do this, do this. Instead of to, to do this, use my great parameter. Using the credential parameter helps you to avoid access denied errors. That's nice. To avoid access denied errors, use the credential parameter. Okay. So now we can get to work. This is the order in which I usually write help. This is not the order that, that help is listed. And the reason that I do that is that I go from specific to general. Okay. So this is my learning process, too. So what I'm doing is, <laughs> as I'm writing help, I'm learning. So I write a really quick first draft of the description. Then I figure out what I'm getting and what I'm returning. Then I go into the details of my parameters. I write my examples. The synopsis is the summary. You have to do it last. Okay. And then I go back and I fix my description and then write the about help. I write about help last because about help is rarely about one function. It's about how to use a bunch of functions to do a task. I need to know those functions before I can talk about using them together. Okay. So let's start with the description. And here's the checklist. Are, are, do we have people actually working on their functions? Great. Okay. So what you want to do in this checklist, and again, these checklists are out on GitHub, is describe the UI, explain the intended use, define or link to the technology. I love Pester. 
It, it starts in on BDD and scaffolding without defining terms, okay? Please, define the terms or link to them. Don't just use terminology that, the, you know, you don't need to describe PowerShell, but anything beyond that in the technology. <coughs> just at least tell people where to, where to go, right? How to find the information, okay? Mention the output type right away so that users understand what they're going to get. Call out any important parameters, list requirements, warn about likely errors. Don't let the user encounter the errors without being warned, okay? Um, if there are any version restrictions, we're going to see this more and more as we move to PowerShell 5 and new features. Do you need to do all of these? No, absolutely not. But what this is, is a checklist, right? Which of these apply? <coughs> Always write in the order of essential, important, and good to know. So if, if the user reads only the first paragraph of your description, they should get the essential information, okay? If they, if they read the important, that's great, but if they stopped reading, at least they have the stuff that's required. So um, this is just a little example that comes from the PSCX module. There's a little commandlet that gives you um, placeholder language. And this is how I wrote the description. First, I used the template to get some bullet points. And then I put together the description. So I'm going to give people who are working about four minutes to begin to, to do the first draft of their description. Yeah. I have a couple of issues. Yeah, and, and work with each other. I'm, uh, I'm not sure if you noticed this one, but it's a fine line in Gordon. No, 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 thank you. Um, so that's just in that part. Yeah, so yeah. There. Um, the other thing, I'm getting is to validate for the schema. Get this. Um, well, that was yeah. my question. Yeah. Today. Which a description is unexpected um, for the return value to its type. So, uh, but I wasn't able to see, so I went to see 218. Uh, so, um, <coughs> um, outputs here. So, I previously had, um, I had inputs in there as well, um, which was giving the same error. So, I deleted that, and now it's moved down to. Right, so the inputs so wasn't the error, there's well, something well, else. the inputs was originally the error, so right. I deleted that. Yeah. Right, now but then, <coughs> but the, yeah, as, so it's something else, it's not inputs or outputs, and it might be something else. So I'm not sure, but I can't quite figure out where the problem is. Um, and also, like, in the <coughs> slides, it doesn't have to be No, it's not mandatory. Yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely not. Um, so, so, I can't even know where to go. Yeah, well, let's like, can you still write your description? So, go, go to the top. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So yeah. That's, that's a good start. So why don't you work on the front and then we'll solve the problems. Yeah. Uh, well, I just, I kind of have gotten to a stage now where I'm okay with it. Yeah. But let's, let's deal with that so, I'll, so that we can figure out what's going on. I, it's really difficult to debug. Okay. So yeah. just fill out. Um, yeah, so go up to the description. So what you're working on, I'm going to go back here and put the description checklist back up. So this, this is where we are. Right now. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, so what you're thinking of, what you're thinking of is someone approaches your commandlet or function, right? What do they need to know? So, so you want to start with what does it do? Okay, how does it work? What does it return? Okay, um, what does the user need to gather in advance in order to use it? So these are all things that go into the description. Okay. okay. So uh, the synopsis part, of it, will we cover that later? Yeah, the synopsis is at the end because it's a summary. You can't summarize what you haven't written. By using uh, XML, yeah. Uh, 
do you use the update help for function as well then uh, or yeah 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 to do update help you actually have to do a bit of other work yeah. you have to take the help file yeah. you have to um, add a help info XML yeah. file you have to put it in a CAD okay. put it somewhere add um, in your module manifest you have to add a help URI okay. help info URI yeah. key that's all documented yeah yeah and, and help write it as no, it does not. Okay. No, it does not. But it will in a future version. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, boy, I wish it did. Yeah. Yep, yep. Yeah, did you, did you guys hear the question? The question was about whether HelpWriter um, packaged things for updatable help, and it does not yet. No. Um, but it, that, I wish it would. That would be a great feature. So, and again, this is a 1.0. Yeah. So, yeah. I have it in the suite. I haven't just looked yeah. at it so much. Um, it's the, the process for creating um, updatable help is, I wrote it, it's still in MSDN. Mm. So I can't fix it if it's wrong, mm. <laughs> but I could file a bug. Mm. So, um, but I think it's pretty complete. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's not a big yeah. thing. No. I'm just curious. No, it's well, fine. Because that one side part of the XML that you could do that yeah. if needed. So. Yeah. You know, and doing online help is even easier. You mm. just need... Um, a help info URI key mm. in the, or a help info mm. um, item, or the first related link mm. in the help, yeah. Can we write the help for classes? Yeah, you know, there's, there's, I have a slide on that. There's really no defined help for classes, but I, I do have a slide How to show you what I do. I can't hear. How do we call it? Um, I run it, I, I call it like you would call about help. Yeah. Um, it's true for DSC resources as well. Um, in, in, in the very first few previews of PowerShell 5, there was an XML schema for DSC resource help, and it was broken. They, it hadn't been tested yet. And um, they pulled it in the latest releases, so it seems to be gone. Okay. Do folks want a few more minutes for this, or I can go on to the next thing? Oh, we're about the halfway point. Okay. So I'm going to keep going. I'm available, you know, free of charge for help at any time I'm on Twitter. And if you send me a function and you're having trouble with your help, I'm happy always to help if I have time. Okay. So here's a little description that I wrote. It describes the commandlet UI. It explains the intended use. This is a really simple commandlet. Okay? And it warns of some likely errors. This isn't random. Okay? So in the PSCX module, this is the description of read archive. The read archive. Does that, do people know the read archive commandlet? In PowerShell 5, we now have what? Compress archive and expand archive. But we don't have read archive. This is a fabulous thing because it allows you to distinguish what's, go what's inside the archive from what happens when you expand it because your expand tool might have changed what's inside. You know, it might have added an extra directory level or something like this. So here's the original description for read archive. Enumerates compressed archives such as 7Z or this looks like a typo. Right? Emitting archive entry objects representing records in the archive. Read archive is useful if you wish to perform. Mm -hmm. okay. Too many words. Okay. No white space. Okay. When reading on the screen, readers have trouble getting, there are technical terms for this, but from the last word of one line to the first word of the next line. If you have something this long, it's hopeless. Okay? So what you want to do is, in general, no more than maybe four or five lines in a paragraph, break it up. You know, no more than one or two sentences in a paragraph, break it up. So this is what I did with Read Archive. Gets the files in a compressed or archived file. I looked this up and learned how to spell it correctly. Not a big deal. Didn't take me long. Okay. 
Without unzipping or expanding the file, it returns archive entry objects that represent the files or records in the archive. Here's my two. To expand only selected items, do this. To override the archive format, do this. If you wish to, no. Yeah. Just a question about verbs, but yeah. most of you say read, but most of the time you use get. Wouldn't it be get? Yeah, I think. Index I, I think. Content? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that the reason that they use read, and again, this is a choice yeah. of the function, was that it actually goes inside without ever opening it. Yeah, okay. yeah so that's kind of a yeah, yeah. yeah. It it doesn't actually get. No. Yeah. Okay. Are we ready to go on to the next thing? Okay. The next thing I do are inputs and outputs. Some people skip these. I think they're essential. And the reason that I think they're essential <laughs> is that often what I want to do, once I've gotten something from your command list, is pipe it to something else. If I don't know the output type, I have to go looking for it before I can set up my piping. If I don't know what I can pipe to it, right? which parameters take value from pipeline or value from pipeline by property name, right? I have to go looking. You have shifted the burden from the person who knows that function best to a user who's busy, right? So do the inputs and outputs. It'll take you a minute and it will save people a lot of time. If you go back there, just one quick yeah, question. Yeah, sure. The output there, it's quite a, yeah, it's output object, but, but it's very generic. <coughs> I'm not sure which properties I want to right, get. Right, right, right. I, I understand. Be... Yeah, that's one of those things about custom objects, yeah. right? Would so, you try to describe it uh, as you will have the property name that is a string and you will have a copy? Yeah, so there are two places that I use custom objects yeah. all the time. There are two places I would describe it. I would mention it in the description and I would be very explicit in the example. Yeah. Question there, is it preferable to add the type to the custom object so it actually becomes Yeah, your, to, your but, but, then, but then it will be an unfamiliar type that the user can't look up in MSDN, so mm. you need to let them know that as well. Yeah, yeah. So if, what, what he's saying <clears> is that you can go in and do what it is, PS, it's PS object something type names, yeah. right? And you can add a type name, you can insert a type name so that your custom object has a unique type name. Right? And that's a great thing to do. It's a best practice. It's in the tool making book. Um, I do it when I'm being, um, using best practices. Right? Um, but then your output type will be something that you can't look up. Right? So you just need to let the user know what it is. Yeah, no problem at all. <clears throat> so, so basically, this is what happens. Inputs are types of parameters that take value from pipeline or value from pipeline by property name. And you can put a description in there that tells which parameters. So here for invoke command, one of the things you can pipe to invoke command is a script block. And the little description is you can pipe a command in a script block to invoke command. Use the input automatic variable to represent the input objects in the command. Okay. If I had a custom object, this might be the place where I would begin to explain what's there. But I don't think I would want to go into detail about the, um, about the members and their type until I were, was in the example. Okay. Okay. The output type, in order to get the output type, I use the output type attribute in my commandlet. Do I, do I need to switch? Let's grab some real code here. Where do I have it? Right. Here we go. Okay. So here's the output type attribute. Mm. Okay. Again, it just takes a minute. It's really easy to do. It helps your user. This makes your code somewhat self-documenting, right? And if you use something like PowerShell Help Writer, it will go and look for the output type and add those output types automatically. Okay. All it takes. Oh, and also if you're using um, PowerShell Studio, and you have a function like this, you can right click and click generate comment based help, and it grabs all the parameters in the output type and thing for you. Okay. So use your tools. Okay. So folks who are writing in this workshop, I see that a lot of people don't have laptops open. But this is a good time to add your inputs and outputs. Okay. 
in um, common face help, it's sort of free form. So what I always do is the first line is the um, output type, and the second line is the description. This is just the name of the command line. It doesn't go there. That was for reference. Again, input type, the first line is the type, and anything after that is the description. Questions? Yeah. How many people have written comment-based help and used the inputs and output fields? Great. You guys are like the best of the best. <laughs> Flick back to show me the syntax of the output. Absolutely, file. right there. Yeah. Uh, uh, the the one in the the attribute in the in the code. The oh, sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Totally. Um, where did I put it? <coughs> what was the question? Uh, just to see the the okay, so it's just a the output attribute. type attribute. Yeah. Okay, great. And this is described. Where did I do it? Um, about functions, advanced <laughs> parameters, I think, or command the binding attribute, maybe. <coughs> oh, no, no, no. We wrote a separate help file. Yeah, it's, separate. Yeah, it, it's um, about functions advanced. What is it? Yeah, output types. I'll, I'll find out. I'm sorry that I don't know. Okay. Are you good, Justin? Yeah, yeah I'm good. Thanks. Okay. And we're ready to do parameters. Again, we're going from very specific to more general. <clears throat> Parameter descriptions. If I see one more time, the name is the name, right? Why write it at all, right? <laughs> what value have you given me, right? Enter the um, MSI code. Where do I get it? How do I find that thing? So there are some things which give me no information at all, and some things which assume that I know things that as a user I might not know. Okay. So the first thing you want to talk about in a parameter is the effect on the commandlet behavior. Okay. What does this do if I use it, and what happens if I don't use it? Then, separate from that, it's how do I format my parameter values so they work? Okay, and those are two separate things. Okay, so first what I want to do, so, so let me give you an example. So if I have a computer name parameter, right, the effect is that it specifies the computer. And it's required if I'm using a remote computer because the default is my local computer. Okay, so the effect is that it uses something other than the local computer. That's a big deal. People never say that, unless I'm writing the help. <laughs> Separate from that is how do I specify the value of this parameter? Okay. So you can almost think of this line as documenting the dash computer name, and this <coughs> line as documenting the values that, of the computer name parameter. Mention the default value for all optional parameters. Describe what it does, okay? Explain how to get the parameter values, especially if they're wonky. And talk about interaction with other parameters, okay? If you do this, this happens. If you use these two together, you get a different result, okay? Parameter attributes, in general, your tools will pick up. Right? If you're using tools, if you're using something like Help Writer, um, I think Command Help Editor, remember that? Command Help Editor will also grab the parameter attributes. It cannot get globbing because it's not specified in the language. What is globbing? Globbing. Um, can you use wildcard characters in okay. the parameter value? Right? And it, do, it can't get the default value. Again, I have, there's a bug out or a request out on Connect to specify the default value for a parameter in a systematic way so that tools can detect it, but we don't have that now, okay? You should be able to get equals something, right? But the language doesn't recognize it, okay? Here's a great hint. Reuse des good descriptions, right? If you're doing something like the credential parameter, something that's used a lot, you don't need to write from scratch, right? 
Go find one that you like. This one comes from Get Windows Feature. I didn't write it, but it's my very favorite one. Okay? It's very clear. It explains how the credential parameter works and all of the different values that I can use. Start with this one. Don't, don't write from scratch. Right? You don't need to. And if you have, if you have a function that's actually using a well-known commandlet or function to actually get the data, you know, inside your function, you're calling get WMI object or get some instance. And all you're doing with your, for instance, here it's a computer name parameter. If all you're doing with your computer name parameter is passing it to the next commandlet, go grab its computer name parameter description. Right? No need to rewrite it. Really easy. And then I have some parameter description checklists for commonly used parameter names. So here's the one for name. Instead of the name is the name. Five? Okay, cool. We're going to go really fast. Okay? So can I pick any name? Does it have to exist already or do I have to create it? Are there any naming requirements? Here's one for Azure. Does the name need to be unique in a certain scope? So I have some for Path. These are all out on GitHub because Don says I need to hurry. Computer name. Let's do the examples. If you write no help, other than examples, you have probably contributed something, okay? The examples are the most important part of help. They're the show in the show and tell. So best practices, okay? This is the most important one. Examples are not your chance to show how smart you are. We know, <laughs> okay? This is not your chance to impress your friends, okay? You're teaching. This is your chance to help someone use your function, okay? Make it instructive. Each example should be the model or a template for a real life, real world command. Teach one concept in each example. We all want to use error handling. It doesn't go in your example, unless you need to do error handling a certain way because of the way your function works, okay? Show the expected output so that when the user runs the example, it works. And they can test and they can distinguish between a mistake that they've made, right, and, a and you know, what the, exp the output as it's expected, right? They can tell when they've made a mistake. Should I have an example that fails to share that? that that's, if, if, it's a common, if it's a common failure, absolutely, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it wouldn't be the first example, but definitely, yeah, okay? So here are some guidelines. Use each parameter at least once with a realistic parameter value. Um, people can use your parameter value as a formatting guideline, okay? Use full parameter names, no commandlets, no aliases, no, you know, um, what is the percent sign for, for each, none of that because the user is trying to understand no levels of abstraction, right? No levels of interaction. You don't want them to think to have to process any more than, they abs than it's absolutely required in order for them to do that task. So make it try it ready so that when they run the commands, it works. Avoid one-liners, again, not a place to be clever. So here's the guideline. The first example, uses only the mandatory parameters. You might, if you have a complex command, you might need more than one of these, okay? But the first one or two, whatever you need, uses only the mandatory parameters. Then you begin to introduce optional parameters. Then work up to parameter combinations, and the last one should be a real-world example that accomplishes the task that you wrote the function to do. So in that order. Okay. Oh boy. <laughs> so the last thing is the synopsis. And the synopsis is the go, no-go. 
does, you have five, thir you have 30 seconds, like your elevator speech, to tell people whether this is the right tool for the job. Okay. So the, that synopsis should be able to give the user enough information so they know whether, you, you, whether they found the right function or whether they need to keep searching. There's a little checklist for the synopsis. Then you go back and do the final draft of your description, and I apologize for rushing here. And there's also guidelines in here for about help. And the reason that we need about help is that we have modules like this. If you release a module like this without telling users how, in what order to use these, which ones are intended to work together, what tasks they accomplish, then you've actually, instead of giving, giving users a solution, you've given them a problem. Um, we can discuss help for classes afterward. Okay. Let's get to the very end of this. These are all the checklists. All of this stuff is out on Get Help on um, GitHub, okay? And uh, Don is going like this, so I think I'm done. Thank you. <laughs>